Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira, on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events to have happened around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Berlin market attacker Anis Samri shot dead by police in Milan. Tunisian criminal fired at police during a routine patrol in the early hours of Friday. Amri's attack on a Berlin Christmas market on Monday left 12 people dead and 49 injured. Syrian army retakes complete control of Aleppo. Last rebel fighters evacuated from the city on Thursday. President Bashar al-Assad thanks Russia for helping him secure the biggest victory of the war. UNSC adopts landmark resolution demanding all-to-all -all Israeli settlements in occupied territories. Barack Obama's administration refuses to veto resolution. Resolution passes by a 14-0 vote. Funeral for Russia's ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, held in central Moscow. Vladimir Putin takes part in a ceremony at the foreign ministry. Karlov was gunned down by an off-duty police officer in Ankara on Monday. The Tunisian man suspected of carrying out the deadly Berlin truck attack at the Christmas market on Monday, which killed 12 people and injured 49 others, was shot dead by the police in Milan on Friday. The Italian government said Amri was fatally shot after he fired at two police officers who stopped his car for a routine identity check at around 3 a.m. The government said that identity checks had established without a shadow of doubt that the dead man was indeed Amri. A man believed to be the suspect in the Berlin Christmas market truck attack was killed in a shootout on Friday in a suburb in the Italian city of Milan. The shooting reportedly took place before dawn. The dead man was identified as 24-year-old Tunisian Anis Amri. After an investigation, it was found that the person that was killed is without a shadow of doubt Anis Amri, the presumed suspect in the Berlin lorry attack. During the course of investigation, he, he tried to stop the suspect. He immediately drew out a gun and shot the police officers. The police reacted and the person who attacked our officers was killed. The shooting in Milan was followed by news that German police had arrested two men suspected of planning an attack on a shopping mall in Oberhausen in North Rhine-Westphalia. The suspects were identified as two brothers aged 28 and 31 from Kosovo. Essen police got a tip-off from security sources yesterday around 6 p.m. that an attack was planned on the shopping mall in Oberhausen or the Christmas market next to it. We then increased our forces on the ground and we started investigating two suspects. They were arrested in Duisburg at 1 a.m. this morning. On Thursday, the Christmas market reopened in Berlin, three days after a truck ploughed into a crowd at the market killing nine people and injuring 50 others. Flowers and candles were laid at the entrance of the Christmas market. Many people mourned the victims and prayed for those injured in the attack. We came here to indicate that the life must be continued despite the horrible attack. I can understand those people who lost their family members and friends, but I don't think the attack will change my life. A massive influx of refugees is considered one of the reasons for the current insecurity in Germany. So whether the German government will review and readjust its refugee policy has been the major concern of the local people. In my opinion, there are always such people in the world, whether among the refugees or in the social sectors. We should not make sweeping generalization, but our government should not take in those people who make attacks. The police have set up cement barriers in large Christmas markets all over the country to avoid a similar attack. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat to discuss this is uh, former Ambassador Jitendra Kumar Tripathi. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining me on the program. It was a dastardly attack which left 12 people killed, something on the lines of the Nice attack which happened earlier this year. But the casualty figures were not as much as Nice, but nonetheless, 
another refugee seeker attacking or carrying out an attack like this in Europe. You know, what happens now to Angela Merkel's uh, liberal immigration policy? Is it, does it continue? I mean, uh, there are several questions asked about it now. You see, this was, I think, eighth such attack in uh, Germany. Three being in July, one in April, and one in, I think, September or October. Yes, uh, Angela Merkel has got a liberal attitude towards uh, the refugees. But I don't think that in very short period, in very near future, her policies will have a drastic change. Because you'll have to see, you'll have to look into her past for that. She was born to a Polish origin, to Polish origin parents. Though she herself did not experience any Nazi atrocities, but her parents did. And therefore, it was but natural that she would have a very soft corner towards refugees or towards people who are being persecuted. And that is why Germany was Germany very vehemently under her um, allowed and embraced the refugees despite the objections and cautions, ca uh, ca cautions given by the friendly countries, France, Belgium, England, and their security agencies. So, it, it is inherent, it is built inherent in her pers personality. It is very difficult to say that she will very outright or um, um, just overnight she will change the attitude. But yes, there might be some, some strictness in her dealings with refugees now. Because now it has been prob proved that the security agencies were also lapsed in some way. Because as you all know that in July, in, in, in March this year, a, re um, a caution, a watch list, um, this, this person, Anis Amri, was put on a watch list because he was planning to rob some um, establishment or something. But then in another six months by September, they removed him from watch, uh, watch list. And though in November, there had been messages from foreign intelligence agencies that somebody might try to disturb the peace by, um, by attacking in Christmas mob. Angela Merkel didn't do anything. Indeed. Now so she, has got, she has got a position from a very small opposition from within the party, but the far, liberal, far right party, AFD, which has vehemently opposed her policies, and one of the leaders immediately after that told the media that this, these dead, these are Angela Merkel's dead. Indeed. You know, Angela Merkel might not change her policies, but then the people on the ground might look to someone else who have rigid policies towards refugees. So as far as her political ambitions are concerned, because she has said that she wants to run for president for another term, what happens to her political ambitions after this? I think that will be very difficult because SDP, her alliance, is also in a very frail alliance and it's not a very, very wide support based issues. So SDP will also oppose. And the more alarming thing is that her popularity has gone down by more than 10% in last six months. Whereas the far-right party, AFD, its popularity has gone up by 14% and they have also won, their, their candidates have also won in the home district of Angela Merkel. Indeed. And if this situation is not addressed very promptly, then certainly this will result in a downfall of Angela Merkel and a meteoric rise of AFD, which is again very alarming to German people because it is on the other extreme. Indeed, indeed. It is on the exactly other extreme as far as, uh, yes. as, far as their attitude and as far as their policies are concerned. But as far as Merkel is concerned, she seems to be losing friends on the global sphere as well. There's David Cameron who's not there anymore. 
Barack Obama's term is going to end in a few days from now. And then you have Francois Hollande, who's losing popularity as well. So if you see, there is a rise of these right-wing politicians across the world. And day by day, it looks like Angela Merkel is being left out in, in the cold. Yes. She is almost, you can say, she is being uh, uh, lonelier and lonelier day by day because all her friends, all, all her contemporaries who had a little bit of liberalism are being shelved out. Indeed. And you see, now Barack Obama is gone and uh, Donald Trump, his policies are known to everybody. So, though, though Angela Merkel was a staunch, is a staunch supporter of, um, of uh, relations with, uh, developing relations with U.S., but it is yet to be seen whether Donald Trump will accept her policies of liberalization because if he does, then it backfires his own policies, Indeed. his own pronouncements sure. in U.S. Sure. All right. Ambassador, we'll have to lead to that. Thank you so much for joining us on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Thank you very much. Well, moving on now, the evacuation of civilians and fighters from the last rebel-held part of Aleppo concluded on Thursday after long delays because of frigid weather putting all of Syria's industrial capital back in the hands of President Bashar al-Assad's forces for the first time since 2012. The last buses carrying residents from eastern Aleppo left the city late on Thursday night. Tens of thousands of people have been removed from eastern Aleppo since December 15th. Before the last buses left, the Red Cross said that 34,000 people had left the city, including 4,000 fighters who had left in their own vehicles the previous night. The seizure of all of Aleppo by Assad and his allies signals a turning point in the nearly six-year-long conflict. Assad's army relied heavily on foreign military support from Russia, Iran and Shiite militias like Lebanon's Hezbollah, to surround the rebel-held area. Months of shelling and airstrikes that killed hundreds of people and reduced entire neighborhoods to rubble finally routed the rebels and pushed the area's inhabitants to leave under an agreement brokered by Russia, Turkey and Iran. Throughout the conflict, Assad has characterized the rebels seeking his ouster as foreign-backed terrorists and hailed the retaking of Aleppo as a blow to those forces. He also thanked the international backers who helped. Well, it's time for a short break now. Still to come, U.S. abstention allows U.N. to demand end to Israeli settlements. Donald Trump and Israel had urged Washington to use its veto to stop historic Security Council resolution. A White House official says Obama had taken the decision to abstain in the absence of any meaningful peace process. That and much more still to come. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, the UN Security Council has voted for a resolution demanding an end to Israeli settlements. In a break from tradition, the US abstained from voting, allowing 14 out of 15 votes in the council in favor of Egypt's sponsored resolution. The US abstention came despite President-elect Donald Trump's statement asking the US to use its veto powers. The result of the voting is as follows. 14 votes in favor, one abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted as a resolution 2334. The United Nations Security Council adopting a resolution demanding an end to Israeli settlements. The U.S. abstained from the vote, paving the way for the 15-member council to approve the resolution with 14 votes in favor. The voting coming a day after Egypt withdrew the measure under pressure from Israel and US President-elect Donald Trump. New Zealand, Malaysia, Venezuela and Senegal were co-sponsors of the draft resolution. The resolution was the first adopted by the Council on Israel and Palestinians in nearly eight years. After years of following the law to be trampled and the situation to spiral downward, today's resolution may rightly be seen as a last attempt to preserve the two-state solution and revive the path for peace, to keep the hope alive. For many, this seems virtually impossible at this point, as Israel, the occupying power, has been permitted to entrench its occupation and a one-state reality with absolute impunity. At times, 
even being rewarded for its violations and intransigence. Against this backdrop, one council resolution in, real, in, in nearly eight years is not disproportionate. It is shameful. But today's vote rectifies this record and set us on a new course. Who gave you the right to issue such a decree denying our eternal rights in Jerusalem? Who would this council have had the nerve to condemn your country for building homes in your capital? The U.S. abstention coming despite a statement from President-elect Donald Trump opposing any decision not to use the U.S. veto on the resolution. Traditionally, the U.S. has used its veto power as a permanent member to block resolutions condemning Israel. U.S. abstention being seen as a parting shot by Barack Obama, who has made settlements a major target of peace efforts. We believe though, that continued settlement building seriously undermines Israel's security. Some may cast the U.S. vote as a sign that we have finally given up on a two-state solution. Nothing could be further from the truth. None of us can give up on a two-state solution. We continue to believe that that solution is the only viable path to provide peace and security for the state of Israel and freedom and dignity for the Palestinian people. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he will not abide by the vote. The Palestinian leadership welcomed the resolution. This is a historic day. The international community has stood tall for peace, for hope. The international community unanimously rejected the policies of the Israeli government, policies of settlements, dictation, fait accompli policies. This is a day of hope. This is a day that the international community that said the only way out of this conflict is achieving the two-state solution, whereby the state of Palestine will live side by side the state of Israel on the 1967 lines. President-elect Trump, who will be inaugurated on 20 January, tweeted after the vote. As to the UN, things will be different after January 20th. Jewish settlements is one of the most contentious issues between Israel and the Palestinians. Palestinians see them as an obstacle to peace. Settlements are considered illegal under international law. Israel, however, disputes this. About five lakh Jews live in about 140 settlements built since Israel's 1967 occupation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Going on now, Russia staged a somber memorial ceremony on Thursday for Andrei Karlov, the Russian ambassador to Turkey, gunned down in Ankara on Monday. Russia and Turkey have branded the assassination a failed attempt to derail a rapprochement between Moscow and Ankara, which has seen them cooperate more closely over Syria. Russian ambassador Andrei Karlov, who was shot dead in Ankara, was buried in Moscow with honors. Russian President Vladimir Putin was among those who bid a final farewell to the slain diplomat, who was named a hero of Russia posthumously. The funeral of the assassinated ambassador was held at the Russian Foreign Ministry in Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin attended the ceremony to pay his last respects. A statement from Kremlin said, and I quote, Putin expressed heartfelt condolences to Andrei Karlov's family, his mother Maria, widow Marina, son Gennady, and sister Elena, unquote. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov presented the hero of the Russian Federation star, the country's highest honorary title to the diplomat's family. Today, we bid farewell in the last journey of our colleague, friend, Andrei Karlov, who while on duty became the victim of a despicable and veiled terrorist attack. Putin signed an executive order on Wednesday posthumously awarding Karlov with the title of Hero of the Russian Federation. The burial service was later performed by the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, at the Cathedral of Christ the Saviour in Moscow.
Meanwhile, Turkish Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim paid tribute to the slain Russian ambassador. Yildirim laid red carnations on a makeshift memorial which has been constructed and signed the condolence book, vowing the perpetrators would get the punishment they deserve. Those who try to harm comprehensive relations between Turkey and Russia and destroy the bridge between the two nations with this heinous assassination will not be successful. Those who are guilty will be found one by one and they will get the punishment they deserve. Karlov was shot dead as he was speaking at the opening of an exhibition called Russia in the Eyes of Turks at an art gallery in Ankara. The gunman has been identified as 22-year-old Mevlut Altantas, a member of the Ankara's right police force. On July 12, 2013, Karlov was appointed to the position of ambassador to Turkey by a presidential decree and assumed his new post at the Russian embassy in Ankara. As ambassador to Turkey, Karlov oversaw a difficult period in Russia-Turkish relations, which were severely strained when Turkey downed a Russian jet over Syria in 2015. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, in an attempt to strengthen relations with Central Asian countries, India and Kyrgyzstan have agreed to cooperate on fighting terrorism. Both nations also signed six agreements in various fields, including defense and economic development. Kyrgyzstan is an important country in Central Asia with huge natural resources and a good stock of hydrocarbons. It is also part of the Eurasian zone and a member of the major regional grouping SEO. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President of Kyrgyzstan Almaz Beg Atambayev held summit-level meeting on Tuesday to discuss issues of convergence. They also discussed measures to increase trade and development partnerships between the two countries. Six agreements were signed in the presence of the two leaders in the fields of tourism, agriculture and food industry, youth development among others. Work was also initiated on a bilateral investment treaty. President Atambayev and I agreed on the need to connect our economies more deeply. To this end, we will work to strengthen bilateral trade and economic linkages and facilitate greater people-to-people -people exchanges. We will encourage industry and business on both sides to play a leading role in exploiting opportunities. Cooperation in defense and security with a focus on combating terrorism was also discussed in detail. Both countries will hold joint military exercises next year on counter-terrorism as well as establish the Kyrgyz-India Joint Military Training Center in Kyrgyzstan. We also discuss how we could work together to secure our youth and society against the common challenges of terrorism, extremism, and radicalism. We agreed on the need to coordinate and work closely in addressing and overcoming these challenges for our common benefit. Although Kyrgyzstan is interested in developing a close trade partnership with India, the lack of land connectivity is a major impediment for India to catch up with China in the region. However, both countries are keen to work together to use the Chabahar port route for logistical reasons. Pakistan is not inclined to give their land route to India for Central Asia and China is building roads to connect with Kyrgyzstan, putting a challenge to India for all practical purposes. Earlier, the visiting president was given a ceremonial welcome at the Prashtrapati Bhavan. He also met President Pranam Mukherjee and Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, let's now shift focus and bring you up to speed with all the sports news you might have missed this week in sports action. Former South African cricketer Alviro Peterson was banned for two years for corruption charges. Peterson had admitted several breaches of CSA's anti-corruption code. The two-year ban will be effective from 12th of November this year. He's the sixth player to be banned following a corruption scandal, which led to former international player Gulam Bodhi being banned for 20 years. 
Two-time Wimbledon champion Petra Kvitova has been ruled out for six months after undergoing surgery to her left hand, which was cut by a knife in a burglary attack. Kvitova suffered an injury on all five fingers and two nerves in her playing hand after fighting with a burglar at her home in the eastern Czech town of Prostojov. England's Queen Elizabeth II stepped down as the patron of Wimbledon and will be replaced by Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge. The 90-year-old Queen has been the patron of Wimbledon since 1952. The Queen will also be stepping down as patron of over 20 other charities and pass on her role to other members of the royal family. Bayern Munich went into the winter break three points clear at the top of the Bundesliga following an emphatic win over second place RB Leipzig. Goals from Thiago and Xabi Alonso put the home side firmly in control before Robert Lewandowski made a 3-0 from the penalty spot. It was just a second league loss for the season for Leipzig, who are in their debut Bundesliga campaign. Crystal Palace have appointed former England boss Sam Allardyce as manager on a two-and-a-half-year deal, a day after sacking Alan Padrew. Padre was sacked on Thursday with the club 17th in the Premier League after a run of one win in 11 games. Chairman Steve Paris said that the club was fortunate that someone of Sam's calibre and experience was available. Allardyce has been out of work since losing the England job after 67 days in the wake of a newspaper sting. And finally, owners of two houses adorned with thousands of Christmas lights and Santa figurines opened their doors to the public during the festive season in the Philippines. Since 2010, Christmas house owner Alex Cruz has been adorning the walls and outdoor reception area of his personal residence with tens of thousands of Christmas lights and Santa Claus figurines. And just a few blocks away, a similar house owned by Riss Velanoa is also attracting a lot of attention. I'm going to leave you with these visuals from Manila. Have a very Merry Christmas.